In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the second chapter of the book of Hebrews. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to his will. The first verse of our reading from the epistle to the Hebrews says, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. What was it that those Jewish Christians to whom the letter was written had heard? The epistle begins, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. These people to whom this letter was written had heard the news about Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God, the creator of all things. But the most important thing of all that they heard is that he made purification for sins, for the sins of the whole world, for the sins of those Hebrew Christians, for your sins and mine. That message was one of undeserved grace. They heard that they were forgiven by God himself, even though they didn't deserve to be. I'm sure that 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 caused an abundance of true joy to be present in the hearts of those people when they first heard it. But a problem was creeping into the lives of these Christians to whom this letter was written. 
They were now starting to drift. I remember one summer day when I was about 12 or 13 years old, drifting on an inner tube down the Apple River over in Somerset, Wisconsin, along with a bunch of my family members. It was a rather relaxing, fun, and somewhat educational experience. As we were standing in the river about to start our adventure, the water was only about a foot and a half deep, Dad put his inner tube down next to him on the water's surface while he was helping Mom get situated in hers. When he turned around to pick his inner tube back up, it wasn't there. It was already making its way without him downstream. The lesson that was learned quite quickly that day, which applies to what we're talking about in this letter to the Hebrews as well, is that drifting doesn't require any effort. Drifting isn't like rowing. With rowing, you actually have to put your mind and your back and arms and legs into it. It's deliberate and intentional. But drifting just kind of happens without our thinking about it or even realizing that it's taking place. When you're dealing with a river, there's always going to be current present. It can be out of sight, hidden beneath the surface. It can be so gentle, minute, and non-threatening that you might not even be able to notice that it's there, but it is. And it can move things when you least expect them to be moved, which we found out firsthand. When it comes to drifting spiritually, It can be the same way. All around us in our lives, there are things that are frequently working ever so gently to move us away from God and his word. They seem so placid and serene, calming, soothing, alluring. They're cleverly disguised to us as being no potential problem at all. What kind of things are those? The invitation to go to the ball game with friends rather than to attend church. The temptation to put in those extra hours studying or working instead of coming into God's presence to receive his forgiveness. Those things move us. Maybe only a little bit at a time. But the next thing we know, we're like dad's inner tube, drifting off further and further away from God. One thing about drifting, you will never drift upstream. You will always go with the flow, taking the path of least resistance down and away from where you started. You will not drift toward God. You will only drift away from him. Being a faithful follower of Christ isn't like taking a mindless, leisurely float down a river. It's like rowing your way upstream. It's not that doing it's impossible, but it takes effort to do it. Conscious effort. As a believer, your faith needs to be strengthened constantly by God himself. You can't do it yourself. You have to continue to grow in your knowledge and trust in the Lord because the moment that you stop growing, you will start going backwards and downwards and away. Now, Toward the end of that three mile or so trip on the river, we noticed that the speed at which the things on the river's banks were going past us seemed to be increasing. About the time that we noticed that, we also noticed that some of the people who were ahead of us downstream were paddling their way to the river's banks and were getting out and were taking off down a trail into the woods with their tubes in hand. We wondered why they were doing that. Well, we found out why. It was because of the rapids that were coming up. By the time that we figured out what was in store for us, it was too late. We couldn't get out of the flow. We were stuck. Now, I'm not talking about going over something as big and intense as Niagara Falls, but a couple of the drops that lay ahead on that river were quite high, and the water was really moving. One fellow hit the bottom of one of those jumps at an angle and with such force that his tube flew out from underneath him. He went crashing into the rocks while his poor man's inflatable boat went airborne and and hit a lady who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time solidly upside the head. What did we learn from that moment besides hang on tightly to your inner tube? That drifting can be dangerous, not only to ourselves, but to others too. We probably don't think about how drifting can spiritually impact other people, but it does. 
we demonstrate by our actions that other things in life are more important to us than going to the house of the Lord, hearing God's word, receiving Christ's body and blood in his supper, your kids and grandkids, your friends and neighbors, they all can be influenced by those decisions and those actions of ours. And drifting can not only be dangerous, it can also be deadly. Remember that container ship out in Baltimore Harbor that lost power and drifted along until it hit that major highway bridge, causing it to collapse? People wound up dead because of that ship's unrestrained drifting. Any physical death of a person is tragic enough, but for someone to die spiritually because of drifting? As our text says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? What are the signs that we're drifting? Well, we do what those Hebrew Christians were warned against doing. We stop paying attention to what we have heard. The gospel doesn't seem as important to us as it once did. Bible study and prayer, going to God's house, fellowshipping with other believers, they are not as an essential part of our lives like they once were. The things of the world become more and more appealing to us. Church just gets in the way. And sin, sin doesn't seem to be that big of a deal anymore. I mean, we know that God forgives us and forgiveness is all that we need. We have nothing to ever worry about, right? I heard of one pastor who was preaching on the topic, the sins of the saints. One of his members said, but pastor, we must remember that sin in the life of a Christian is different than sin in the life of a lost person. The pastor replied, you're right. Sin in the life of a Christian is worse. The lost don't know better sometimes, but we do. The Hebrew Christians were displaying troubling signs. They were drifting away from God and salvation. And they were gradually picking up speed and were heading for trouble. That's why the letter that we have in Scripture was written to them. In chapter 10 it says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What can be done on our part to keep us from drifting away? The first thing is that we need to be mindful of where we are and what is going on around us. Watch out for the hidden undercurrents in your life what may seem safe, secure, and harmless at the moment, even pleasurable, might end up carrying you away like the current in the Apple River did with Dad's inner tube. And secondly, through the power of the Holy Spirit who is living in you, keep on rowing against society's sinful flow and continue to grow in your faith. You were marked and sealed in the waters of holy baptism. What Scripture says is true. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Live in your baptism. The old Adam and you should, by daily contrition and repentance, be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires. And a new man should emerge daily and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Remember, he who promised is faithful. And lastly, don't cut yourself free from your anchor. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Apart from him, we have nothing. Cut loose from him, we are headed away from God and over to unbelief and down to eternal death below. God doesn't want that for us. He wants us with him, always. That's why he has given us the warning that we have heard in the letter to the Hebrews today. We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we don't neglect such a great salvation. Christ has done it all for you. You are saved because of his sacrifice. 
Don't neglect that and float away from it. Live in it as he lives in you. Amen. We pray. Loving Father, your son took the little children into his arms and blessed them. Help your people to welcome little ones with joy that nothing may hinder their entrance into the kingdom of God and the arms of Christ. Gracious Lord, you give us men to guide your church on earth. We ask your blessing for Synod President Harrison, District President Lewick, our circuit visitor, and all pastors, together with the many servants and treasures of your church. Lord God, be near all couples struggling in their marriages. Guard them from hardness of heart that would separate what you have joined together, and reconcile them to one another to live in Christ's forgiveness and love. Be near to families torn apart by adultery and divorce. Sustain and heal the wounded with your love. Almighty God, grant your wisdom to our nation's president, to all public servants, and to those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place that they may be upheld in every good deed. Strengthen the professionals and volunteers working in the aftermath of the hurricane. Comfort the families whose lives have been upended and give them hope and the assurance of your presence. Curb the fighting and the unrest in the Middle East. Grant peace and justice to the nations. Provide us here in this country with all that we need to support this body and life as we deal with the fallout from the dock workers' strike. Act to bring it to an end soon for the good of people. Gracious God, you promise to abide with your people and to uphold them in their suffering. Comfort all who are sick and sorrowing, especially Phil, Mike, Vincent, Paula, Chuck, Nancy, Arlene, Yvonne, Linda, Helen, Tina, Harlan, Colleen, Tiffany, Frank, John, and all those that we name in our hearts. Strengthen their faith in the midst of their trials and grant them everything they need according to your good and gracious will. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And we also pray the prayer that he has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.